Can you hear me now on video as well? Okay. Hello, San Francisco. <laughs> no, not really. Um, yes. So, so uh, another reason why I said uh, I was not sure was because I actually don't do a lot of this. Um, I I prefer to to work with uh, my teams and spend time together with those guys. But at the same time, I think this is a great initiative that you have uh, managed to get this. Uh, this uh, session, uh, this series of sessions I've been running about growth hacking because it is super important. Even though I don't really like this term growth hacking, I really hated it when it came out uh, because it's just another, uh, another word for something that a lot of people have done for a long time. Of course, there's some new principles, there's some new technologies on that, 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 can, that can help, but I really don't like it. I think in, in, my, in my mind, uh, the word growth hacking came from some marketing people that had an inferiority complex towards some developers that were hacking and they wanted to be hackers as well. So yeah, we're doing growth hacking. We are cool. We are as cool as you guys. I don't know. Maybe that's where it's coming from. But uh, yes, so uh, I have not been uh, involved operationally in, uh, in, in growing pump companies for, for quite a few years. Uh, I've done that in, in, in the past. I'll get a bit back to that. But of course, I see quite a lot across the, the companies that I'm involved with. And now you, you introduced me as an angel investor today. And actually, uh, it's not really how I view myself. I'm also doing investments. But most of my time today, I am spending as an entrepreneur and as a supporter of entrepreneurs. So I have a handful of companies that I'm very close to, where I work very closely with the teams, typically as a, as a chairman, which is not doing the usual chairman stuff around controlling and governance and all that, but more on what really matters, which is, of course, strategy, organizational structure, culture, commercial uh, strategies, recruiting, and so on, fund fundraising, and so on. And one of the companies that I'm close to is, correct, Genie Bell, but I'm actually a co-founder of Genie Bell uh, back uh, two and a half years ago. Again, I'll come back to that. So why are we here today? Uh, that's because we all have a big interest in, in, in growth, in, uh, in growing, uh, growing solutions that can help out there. Um, and that typically takes the form of, of uh, you know, having a company that builds a product and then try to, to grow from there and help to, to save the world, uh, or at least a, a <coughs> tiny part of the world. Uh, so growth is, uh, is everything these days. And, and uh, hypergrowth, as it's been uh, come known, is, is, is the boss word. You can grow companies way, way, way faster today than, 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 than you could in, uh, in, in the past. There's a number of good, uh, good reasons for that. But growth, 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 growth is really the big thing. It's also uh, because we have, have organized ourselves in such a way that hypergrowth is just absolutely necessary because we raise money uh, for, to cover our expenses for 12, 18, maybe 24 months. And then we run out of money. And if we have not, within that period, uh, reached some proof points, then we are dead. So we just need to, to, to run incredibly fast. And of course, this, this way of funding, this way of growth is again related to ambitions. We all want to conquer the world. And we, we, we only have one life and so on. So growth is, is getting totally crucial to our concept of building companies. That has changed compared to 20 years ago. And it's even more prevalent than it was 10 years ago. So, uh, in order to grow, uh, I mean, you can put up all kinds of theories and, and, and uh, templates for showing growth, and this is a very simple version of it. Uh, it is, you first need to get product market fit, which means you need to develop a product, you need to iterate, and then gradually get customers on board. At one point in time, uh, and, and get, get data and feedback from the, from the first uh, customers, at some point in time, you realize now you have product market fit. And we can have a long discussion about what is product market fit, and how, how far do you need to go down this funnel before you have proper uh, product market fit. But you have product market fit at some scale. And then you, then you decide, now I really want to scale, because now I believe in it, and I think that like 80% of the mechanisms for how I operate the products and how I market and sell the product is kind of OK. So now I can put a lot of money behind my, my big engine, my big growth engine. I've been hacking my growth up until now. And now we just put money and resource into the engine, and then we just, we just go bananas. And it's two very uh, different uh, phases, obviously. Uh, two different uh, kind of mindsets. Uh, over here, you, uh, yeah, you, you need to find exactly the, the, the way you, you, you price it. It fits with the market. The product is fine. Then you, uh, and suddenly, things take off, and whoa, it's fantastic. 
it's awesome. It could all go this way, and that's a bit more annoying. <laughs> but uh, but that's kind of uh, one 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 mindset. I'll come back to a concrete case uh, in a bit on on that. Um, and then we have the scaling part, where you uh, some of you might have heard about this before. But I, I'm totally uh, into how to think about the uh, organizational size and the, 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 how the culture changes as you move through these different uh, sizes. There was a guy called Dunbar. You can Google him. I think like 50 years ago, he realized that you, you can only know 148 people really well. 148 is the number. It's not 42. It's 148. I'm sure this number varies a lot from person to person. I'm sure it varies a lot also depending on you know, social media and what is a friend, what does it mean to know someone's personality and so on. Anyway, the number is 148. Another thing I then suddenly realized, and I don't know if anyone has done research on this, so this is kind of my own research until someone tells me it's not my own research, <laughs> is that there is something about how armies all over the world have organized themselves. It's almost the same numbers, always. I don't know how many of you guys have been in, in, in an army, but it's almost the same numbers they all have and have had for many, many years. So these are the, num the numbers from the Danish army. A group is six to eight guys. A platoon is 25 to 30. A company is 100 to 150. Notice 148. And a battalion is 700. And I've seen this because I've been on a couple of journeys either inside the company or as, as, a, as an observer of the company from the outside, where I can see that every time you pass the threshold, something happens. And it's around culture. It's around how you build your management teams and so on. It just totally changes. And if you don't manage these transitions well, you screw up. Especially here, there's a lot, even with successful products, with good commercial uh, activities on, they stop around the platoon size. I'm sure you know a lot of companies that didn't really manage to get, uh, to get moving from, from, from this level. Maybe they got a shitload of money and they moved to, to 75 or 100 people, but actually, in reality, they never moved the business out of this size. There's a very good reason for this. It is the CEO needs to, to, to change completely way, the way he leads, and many are not capable of doing that. Anyway, so let's, let, let's try and, and go through uh, these, these two... Uh, kind of uh, phases. So this is uh, the example for GiniBelt. Uh, we make a SaaS workflow solution to manage construction projects. Construction is a huge industry, one of the biggest out there. And fun enough, it's one of the ones that have been least disrupted by technology so far. The really big con contractors on the big construction projects, like making the metro here in Copenhagen, they have ERP-based solutions only at the office. They don't mean a lot for what happens out in the field where really uh, all the problems there arise. So we thought, hey, let's do this. Uh, and I uh, found a couple of guys, luckily some of them with, that had like proper construction background because I don't. Uh, and we've then been, been working on this for two and a half years. And it's one of the most <laughs> difficult things I have tried. It's really hard. But now I think actually we have product market features. Now we need to... to uh, yeah, we need to, to, to make it bigger and, and prove the, the product market fit in, in somewhat bigger scale before we can really get a lot of money on board. But anyway, so this is, is, uh, this is the, there's tons of metrics I can show you. We have been born from day one with, uh, with a lot of uh, good uh, data uh, focus. Uh, our CTO is a, is, is a PhD in physics, uh, known by you. Uh, so he likes to put everything into a big database, and he's sitting with this uh, solution called Tableau. Some of you might know it. It's a pretty decent uh, solution for, for business intelligence. And he loves to pull out all these numbers, and the commercial guys, they are all over the place, and the product guys as well. So what this shows is just one, one of these numbers, which is basically a number of recurring users. I've taken out the numbers out here because that's totally confidential. But it's like one and then four. <laughs> no, so um, these are, it's in the hundreds. But, but anyway... Uh, so so we, uh, we started coding August, September 13. Uh, after, I would say, half a year, we started uh, getting something out that didn't really work. Uh, well, some used it, but it was not really workable. And then in November uh, 14, we finally had something. We felt now we can push it a bit more and said, now we're launching. It was not really true, but uh, we had launched one side before, but now we're launching the beta. And then it started working. And then, uh, so this is, uh, this is January, it's a bit high in reality actually. And then, so, so December, no, okay. so around here we started uh, pushing for, for people to pay. So now we're starting to convert. We feel that there's so much, 
so many users coming aboard, and also the all, all the other uh, user engagement metrics uh, around virality and and uh, and how they use the upon so in, uh, in such a way we think we can now push uh, for 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 the pay payment uh, payment part of, of the product. So what have we done? Again, I'm not the operational guy. I uh, haven't been for quite a few years. Uh, but of course, I know what, what, the, what the guys uh, that are much smarter than me uh, on this, that they're doing. So, uh, and I know you would like to have some concrete, concrete things. Let's try and be a little bit concrete. So on the commercial side, uh, what specifically has worked for us in, uh, in this, remember this is a very big industry, but super fragmented and with a lot of people that are not necessarily very tech savvy. And then a few people that are super tech savvy, like engineers that are 30 years old and would love to change the way construction works because there's so many inefficiencies in construction, basically because of lack of communication. It's incredible. It's totally incredible when you look into it. Peer activity, we have built sort of the thought leadership strategy in, uh, in Denmark. We're also a lot involved in, in the UK and a few other countries. Uh, we're sort of born international from day one. The team is also international. Uh, but trying to take thought leadership of how we can change construction. Uh, you can get quite a lot of uh, good PR of that and SEO links and so on. We are then also taking a couple of high profile products we've had and getting the most out of that with pictures in, uh, of us standing on top of uh, big uh, towers and saying, look, we helped to build this, this thing. And again, the guys are very good at storytelling around uh, the people in the team uh, and how that, that links to the passion for trying to change construction for the better. We get good, good PR out of that, we get good SEO links, we get a lot of publicity out of that compared to how big the company actually is. These are the channels. Uh, LinkedIn, the guys are very good at uh, pushing the LinkedIn channel to the level where just before we are being banned. I shouldn't say this, but that's kind of the truth. I will not go into too much detail on some of the tactics here. It's not all dodgy, obviously, but it's, it's good, it works. Email cannons, uh, and then there's a solution called uh, Outreach, uh, where so we don't have to sit and write all these uh, emails and get them back and configure it, but Outreach is very good for automating a lot of this email communication back and forth, so it looks like we are like personally on top of every single piece of communication out there. It works very well. Twitter filtering, some of you guys are probably uh, familiar with that. A lot of followers, a lot of ping pong back and forth. Uh, yes, and then uh, we use Intercom like a lot of other startups uh, to to uh, really uh, manage the communication with those that are already engaged on on the platform. Make that make that very personal, and make it of course uh, make make events that are triggered around how they they use it. And then they get this kind of, of message, and they use another way. They get another kind of message, and they haven't used it. They got a third kind of message, and so on. This all works for us. That's on the commercial side, and this for me is is kind of growth hacking because it's also. Uh, a lot of it is driven out of, again, data on how people are using it and, and put into some algorithms around uh, triggering of communication. Then the product activities. Uh, so this one is someone we all know for a long time. Please focus on one thing and make it real damn good. But anyway, we made this error like three times. Yeah, okay, we just make this little feature over here. Ah, it's and then we spent three months on that and scrap and they're all back on the core feature again. <laughs> so please just try and focus on one on one module at a time. But that's shit. That, that what we've done now on the, the core model is, 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 is absolutely super cool. I saw a couple days ago someone make a, making like a, an international, really well known international blog about like the 10 best uh, construction uh, solutions out there and we were one of them and we were the out of I'll say there were like two or three of them that were some proper modern SaaS based the rest were big enterprise solutions that you can't really use in in, in SME companies so that's we start to get some uh, some some pro publicity around what we can do then on Caesar hail Caesar that's the one of our our uh, big things so what we did is, uh, we have this amazing product UX guy, he's amazing, a British guy uh, called Bob. He's a former architect from Foster's, which is one of the most famous uh, architect companies in the world. So he knows the construction industry inside out. And then he's a, he's a good spinoid UXer. And, uh, and, and he's just, he's both data driven, he's got flair, he got personality, he's just everything. It's fantastic, I love him. And, hi Bob, I love you. And uh, so, so one of the things he did a while ago is that he tried to take all the different main parts of, of our solution and, and put it into a, a fairly simple uh, hierarchy of, of actions that you as a user could go through. And then we, we measure all kind of, of uh, we measure these steps in, in a lot of details and also the di dynamics between the different details and how they convert and how the font changes as we make changes and make A-B tests and so on. And it's called CESA, of course, because it's sign up, explore, action, etc. So that's our CESA. 
And, and we're doing this quite disciplined. And it's not something you just say day one, we, let's do this, and day two, you have all the day. It takes a lot of time, again, back to our CTO who loves all this data to put in. It takes a bit of time, and also you need to have the right BI tools to show it and, and see all the patterns and so on. And you need to have the discipline and the culture to actually have this as part of your product development process. And it really works. It's, it's been, been, been pretty cool. Without this, we would not have been able to iterate as fast as we've done the last half year. The last half year have been super efficient in this. The year before, not so much. Uh, we brought design and development closer to iterate faster. Again, the usual thing, you know, uh, the poor guy, he wants this, and developers, they want something else. Well, most of our developers are sitting in Lutz in Poland, some really, really strong guys. We have uh, five, six guys down there, and of course, there's a distance with the guy that's sitting in London and so on. But we've been managing to, through different initiatives, to bring them closer, so we are more efficient now. And the two other ones uh, that has helped us to iterate and get inside is user complaints are always right. Uh, keep digging to understand if they say something. But just because that uh, they always write in terms of the problem, they don't necessarily write in terms of the solution. We had something we call beats, which I'm sure you can understand what it is. And some they said, but this beats, it doesn't work. It's just all over the place. So they want to get rid of it. A lot of users said, we want to get rid of it. But of course, that was not the solution. The solution was to make the beats smarter and more customized. So you, you got the beats that you need and not all the other noise out there. Robust Q&A has helped. Speed reliability, again, classic thing that when you make a product, it just helps that it takes uh, a fraction of a second to load instead of three seconds. When you have a workflow solution, it has to go super fast. And we can see how our metrics have really helped after this was fixed. Really, speed is super important. Again, an old learning all the way back from the dot-com days. So these are some of the things on the commercial side and product side. We've been iterating, da 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 data-driven, the whole team focus on this, it really has helped. So, and it's not like Genie Bell is now uh, the next uh, unicorn or anything. I can assure we have a long way ahead of us, but, but we have come off the ground uh, finally. That's really, really good. So, uh, so this, this is kind of what you do in the early phases. Uh, we've been doing this at Genie Bell for two and a half years. Uh, we had hoped it would take like 12 months, but now we're two and a half years in, and, and uh, we're still not completely done with some of this. But then let's say that, that, okay, fine, you're really there, you, you're now ready to pour a lot more money into this, uh, this engine and just, you know, keep, keep uh, exploding in a, in a good way. Then it's, it's, it's a different mindset. Something else happens, and there's a migration towards, uh, for everybody to think in a slightly different way. So I have participated in, in, in three, like, really big uh, journeys with uh, companies that have grown into the multi-billion kroner uh, um, uh, phase, uh, and in three different kind of roles, and three different kind of hacking methods, and three different kind of cultures. So very briefly, Scandinavia Online, how many in here remember Scandinavia Online? Good old Scandinavia Online. Yes, fantastic company. Maybe not so much. But anyway, so I was a, a co-founder of the Danish company that then merged into a number of other companies, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. We became like the biggest digital online company in, in, in the Nordics. I was in the management team in, in Stockholm. We did the IPO. I actually left a few months before the IPO, a little bit uh, unusual, but uh, that's what I did. And it was actually a half a billion euro company. And then, of course, dot com crash and ba ba da ba da, it was sold. So, point one growth hacking back then was very different. It was not data driven the way we, we talked a lot about guerrilla marketing. That was like the big thing back then. Lots of uh, distribution deals, partnership deals, and banner exchanges, and all that kind of stuff. That's what worked back then. Uh, and it was not really data driven. I mean, maybe a little bit around uh, conversions and so on, but that was really quite quite limited. The business model of the company, I would say, was a bit dodgy. I would say that today. Uh, I think it's better than better than than our own uh, the the classic Danish exam UB, but not a lot more. And the culture of the company was. Uh, you know, okay, but actually not right either. The whole dot com thing, there was just too much, it was too messy and too uh, out of touch with the, uh, with the realities. I long story about that, I don't have time for that, but culture is not quite right uh, for, 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 for anything really. Just Eat, uh, I'm sure you all know that company. Uh, so this was 97, this was 2008 to 2003, and this one I had a different role, I was CEO and chairman. Uh, the, the growth hacking when I came on board was, 
was a bit like growth hacking today, where it's sort of a, a, a hybrid between the good old days and what we have today, but not data-driven either at, at all. But there, there was a kind of mindset at least. We are not becoming quite good at it, but I would again say not like, not like you do it today. Again, not super data-driven. Very energetic, very creative, very energetic, trying all kinds of things and so on, but, but again, uh, not like you would do it today. Uh, when it's really good. Uh, the culture, when I came into the company, parts of it was really good, parts of it was awful. Uh, so we had to go through a cultural transformation. And actually, we managed then to, 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 to have a thriving culture that uh, I think lasts almost to this day today, where it's a stock list a company, it's a 3 billion uh, euro company, FTSE 250. And uh, maybe not quite the, the culture we had a call years ago, but anyways, it's, it's, it's a culture that kept some of the parts of being a startup while also really having a culture that with a scaling mindset. Then Wahanda, which has now been renamed to Treatwell uh, a week ago, uh, our chairman for the last three years, again from 40 to we now around 450, European leader in the beauty space because I just know a shitload about beauty, which is obvious when you look at me. Uh, and the company is, is a big company, it's not a billion euro company uh, yet, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a big valuable company, it's 75% exited. The growth hacking in Wahanda is much more like, like uh, the way you would like to do it today. Lots of data put into a big uh, data warehouse called Luca, you might know this, with a lot of people accessing this, a lot of people on the commercial side, on the product side, on the operational side, accessing all this data and trying to iterate. We're not like superstars it, but we are way better than, than for example, at, at Just Eat. We have the data, we have the mindset, we have, I think we have uh, like five, six full-time BI guys on board. In Just Eat, I mean, when we had this size, we maybe had one. And we did not have a data warehouse. And, and again, hacking was something different. So way, way, uh, way more advanced, maybe not world-class, but way more uh, advanced. So these are the three examples where I've been on, on the inside in quite different uh, roles and very different experiences. So culture, I mentioned this already a little bit. So, the, 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 so what kind of culture do you need to, uh, to kind of uh, make it big? Uh, you need to be creative, you need to be fun, you need to be interprofessional. Oh, stop, interprofessional, I need to talk about this one. This is one of my favorites because I invented this word. <laughs> this word will be incredibly famous in the next 10 to 20 years. I, this is actually, I'm actually testing whether it's possible for me to basically take ownership of a word and become famous, build a book, or make, write a book and make a film and all that shit just based on one word. That's my, that's my test. So let me just spend a bit of time. What is an interprofessional? Some of you might have heard this before, but you, you're going to love it again. So and what, what I've seen so many times, and this is a little bit, again, come back to the two basic phases about hacking and growing uh, or scaling. You have the classic entrepreneurs. This is a Just Eat picture from Will before I came in. This is the team a couple of years into the, the journey. This is a, yes, a book here. Some of you guys might know this. It's Matthias, the original salesman. Yeah, and Rune might be here somewhere as well. Whatever. So classic entrepreneur, you know, he got, he got uh, green hair and he's a bit crazy. He's opportunistic. He's a risk taker. He's not necessarily systematic, but there's <coughs> just so much energy in this guy, right? Passionate and so on. And then the professionals over here, they are structured, they're strategic, they're analytical and all this. And what I've seen so many times is the, these two groups, they, they don't like each other. You know, these say these are corporate bankers, these say they're crazy animals. <laughs> but the people I like to work together with, the people when I'm investor, investing and people I really want to work together with when I, when I go deep in a, in, a, in a company, they're the guys I call entrepreneurs. So fine enough, they're the guys with a, with a foot, with a leg in each, each camp here. They understand when we need to have this emphasis in our company, what is the phase? And they can also switch to having this mindset over here. It's super difficult, not many people do this, but these are the people I believe in because they're the ones that can go all the way. They can support the company not only for this, these two years uh, or that, that all, the, the next phase, but they can go through many years of scaling and bringing the, 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 you know, the history with them uh, throughout the, the, uh, the growth of the company. These are the people I, 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 I really like. So you need to be professional. You need to have passion. You need to have a great team. Definitely ambition, energy, whatever. Right? You need all, <laughs> a lot of things in a culture. And, and we can all put tons of things up here on, on what we want to be, all these nice and fantastic things. But it little, a little bit misses uh, the point. You have to find your own personal uh, touch on what your culture is. So 
And this is where we, it's sort of another kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of hacking. Um, when you hack, you are very detail-oriented. And you try to observe a lot of things, get feedback, and then you are detail-oriented again in how you execute and approach it. And, 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 and the thing about managing and building and leading a culture is almost the same, same mindset. You really have to be super disciplined, and you have to be into the details, because the, often tiny, tiny events in the company can drive a lot of bad stuff or a lot of good stuff. This is the CEO perspective, or at least very senior perspective. Chairman, CEO, top team perspective. Be super disciplined. This goes for everybody. You need to be able to sacrifice anyone. And, and for that matter, um, praise everyone. It is a truly big thing. At the end of the day, for me, this is the most important thing. You can run a company with a shitty culture for a year or two. But what I like being is, is companies that are built to be sustainable, real companies, not an exit after two and a half years because some strategic buyer wanted to have this patent over here in the corner. I'm talking about real companies. And for that, it is the biggest thing you have in a company. Screw this up and you can't hire the best people, you can't make the best people work together, and then you're becoming average, and if you're average, uh, you know, who, who wants to be average? You're not gonna build a great company this. You need, as a CEO, to risk your own neck. You need to be able to ridicule yourself and be in the front of something that might be seen as totally ridiculous. And expose yourself. It needs a very strong character as CEO to take your personality, because you, the culture of the company is totally linked to your personality. You can't pretend to be someone else and you can't, you can't drive a culture which is linked to some other personality. You need to be able to expose yourself, really. That takes a lot of uh, guts. So a lot of details, again, I could, again, there's tons of examples, right, but it's how you, how you interview when you, when, you, when you recruit people. It is super important. And I can give you tons of examples of crazy things that have happened in interviews that really shows who you are as a person, as a company. How you intro, right? I remember a company, good old dot-com days, they failed, but they did a couple of things really well. One of the things they did was, when you came in the first day, they said you collect your own table. They just had to collect your own office, your own, just collect everything. We're not doing this shit. We are a hands-on company. We expect everyone to work hard and be hands-on. We don't care if you are head of this department, you're a junior guy, just get your stuff done and get up and, and running as quickly as possible. It sends a good signal. Another example. The guy, my good friend and partner, Lupo Champelimo, the guy who's uh, co-founder and CEO of Wahanda, he don't want people to eat McDonald's. He just banned McDonald's at the office. I think it's totally weird, right? But it says something about who he is and what he believes in and the kind of people he wants to surround himself. It's a weird, tiny little, but it's a, it's a clear signal. It says something. I don't know exactly what it says, but it says something. <laughs> what you're aware, I was uh, my first job uh, out of uh, school. I'm an economist by background, so it's out there. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, I admit it. I was at McKinsey. And McKinsey, these consultants that, uh, you know, the, you look like an undertaker uh, most of the time. <laughs> and I, I, I had some partners. They were really into what tie I was wearing. I felt it horrible to wear uh, this costume. So I said, what can I do to like, have a little bit of personality in myself? Ah, I have the tie. So I put a tie with butterflies or something, and there will be parts like, what, the, what is this? Well, are, you, are, you, are you going to take this to a client, this butterfly? You can't do it. It's like, come on. But again, it sent a signal about who they wanted to be. I'm not sure it's like that anymore, but back then it was. Offsite activities. Did you join the strip club? Did you go to the strip club and get engaged down there? This is a real life example. I don't want to go into details, we can do it, talk about it afterwards. But actually, there were uh, uh, a company I, I know very, very, very well and was working uh, together with for a long time where when I joined, this is what, what the guys they did. We went to the strip club. Yeah. And that was part of what kept this company together. I felt that was totally wrong, so we changed that. But anyway, it's an example of how <laughs> other things could, you know. Language you use, uh, again, I find in a lot of companies that have built uh, like a strong, vibrant culture, that actually the language you use, it becomes a specific, a specific country. In Just Eat, we, had, we started having a lot of words and concepts that were really specific to us. Tick a tick, uh, was, was a, it's very difficult to explain what tick a tick is, but it became a word we used in many situations. We said, oh, this is tick a tick. And then everybody, ah, it's tick a tick. And the jam was how we described our culture. You know, is this guy, is he jammy? No, he's not really jammy. And then you just knew what jammy meant. Is this a jammy event? Ah, it's not really a jammy event. Okay. Uh. So you start to get your own lingo. And that's often what you see in, in, uh, in, in, in companies that manage to create really a strong, vibrant culture. 
And then one of my, my, my personal favorites is humor. You know, how you use uh, humor on an every, you know, just every single day. I, I, uh, whoops. I use humor a lot because I love laughing. And I just realized over time, it's a great way of, of building bridges between very different people with, with slightly different mindsets, right? In, in like proper companies, you have tech guys, you have ops guys, you have sales, you've got marketing, you've got the soft guys, you've got the hard guys, you've got the girls, you've got the boys, and so on. And there's a lot of conflict in that because you're pushing everybody to the limit of what they can do and forcing them to work together. So there's all kinds of conflicts arising all the time. And how are you going to defuse that? Well, humor is fantastic for defusing a lot of intense situations. I use that a lot. I've just seen again and again, it's, it just works. So uh, that was a bit about sort of all the details that actually, you know, as a CEO or like in charge of leading a company, you have to be super detail oriented around your culture. Even the small things, they can have a big impact on something. I, I can want to tell a hundred stories now about just small things that have a big impact. We don't have time for that because I think I'm running out of time. So the last thing I want to say is these are two very different kinds of hacks, right? You have the product market fit hack, and you have the culture hack when you start to, 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 uh, to scale. And of course, you also have a culture when you are 15 guys. But the funny thing is, it matters a bit less. Where it really matters to have the right culture when you're 15 is so much easier to move a good culture with 15 uh, people towards 150. If you have the wrong culture when you're 15, it's a bit more difficult. But anyway, as a CEO, where you have the emphasis, you just need, I mean, you're not, you're not going to survive if you don't get that product market fit. And later on, to build it big, this is where you have to focus in relative terms. This is an external journey. You look at data from the outside, from customers. This is very much an internal journey. It's a soul-searching journey for the CEO and the guys leading the culture. It's really, who am I? What kind of company do I want to create? How, how, what, what kind of people do I want to surround myself? What makes me happy as a CEO, as the guy who's running the company? It's a soul-searching uh, journey almost. Problem you adapt to other people, you adapt to the customer's needs. Over here, a little bit productive, Fuck, the other guys have to adapt to you. I'm sure you, do, you disagree with this, a lot of you, but it's difficult to be someone else than who you are. It really is. And you can try to work with people that are different than you, and you should, but in general, there'll be some tendency to surround yourself with people that are maybe different, but, you know, they have to adapt a bit to you. Over here, you're constantly improving. Over here, you're almost constantly defending who you are and who, what kind of culture you are. You're def hey, this is shit. Don't, I don't like this. You know, this, this is not the way we have lunch in our company. I, and the reason why we don't have lunch in our company is because da da da. I mean, this is stupid. Why can't we have McDonald's burger? Because I don't want McDonald's burgers. You're defending it. You don't want to have McDonald's burgers on the lunch table. Right? It's, you're constantly arguing for things that look a bit ridiculous, but there's a point behind it. Particular CEO focus in the early days and then particular CEO focus in the later days. I'm not saying you shouldn't do this in the later days. You should, uh, I'm just saying there is a difference. And often, in a very simplistic uh, model, where it goes wrong is when the, the team has to do this journey. Either the team, they can do it, or they have to migrate to another team that takes over and do this journey for them. So I don't know where we are uh, time-wise, but that was as fast as I could do it. I can tell another hundred funny stories, but uh, I think that's about it. I think we should take some time for questions. But I think we should start by saying thank you. Yeah, thank you.